Okay, so in this video we're going to look at what's called the kinetic model of matter. So using what we've learned earlier from the mechanics topics to explain what's going on as things change phase from solid to liquid to gas and so on, and how they behave as we heat them up in between those points. So in this video we're going to look specifically at you know, some key properties of your solids, liquids and gases. That should mostly be revision for that, but we'll look at a few new parts of that too. Uh, we're going to look at each of the phases of matter in terms of the kinetic energy and also in terms of potential energy. And then we're going to look at what happens to the atoms or molecules in the material as we heat it up, or indeed as we cool it down, or the reverse process would happen. So that's what we're going to deal with today. So first of all, let's just review a couple of things to make sure you're clear what they are. So first, kinetic energy. Hopefully you should know it half times mass times speed squared, and uh, because it uses speed it's a scalar property, and you should know that if you have, if a particle has more kinetic energy, that means it's travelling at a higher speed. Um, so that gives you an idea of what's going on there. So the other thing you should know is, think in, especially in solids and then less so in liquids and even less so in gases, the atoms of the substance are bonded to one another, or they're attracted to one another, or they're held together by a force of the bond. So if they're attracted or held together, that means they have negative potential energy. Uh, so I'm not going to define exactly what kind of energy that is, because it's more complex, because you've come across things like elastic potential energy, or gravitational potential energy, or maybe even electric potential energy. Um, if things are attracted to each other, that means they have negative potential energy, and the closer they are, the more negative that potential energy becomes. So when you look at gravitational fields, um, you'll, they always have negative potential energy because the gravitational force is always attractive. In electric fields, when you have like a positive and a negative charge and attracted, again, you always have negative potential energy. It is exactly the same in the packing of solids, liquids, and gases, that kind of thing there. So, what does this negative potential energy actually mean? So, the more negative your potential energy is, what that means is it's going to take more work to split you up. Uh, so, a solid, where everything's really closely packed together and has very high negative potential energy, takes a lot of work to separate into liquid and gas and so on and so on. Uh, so, that's what we mean by potential energy. So, in terms of the kinetic model of matter, let's first look at a solid. So we've got a diagram of roughly what a solid looks like. You can see we've got a nice, closely packed arrangement of the molecules or atoms, and it's a very regular system of packing there, so it's really organised. So those are the key properties of a solid. But these are not stationary. Nothing is ever actually stationary, regardless of how cold you make it. These will always be vibrating, but they vibrate about the same position, so they don't move relative to one another. So because they're not really moving around, just vibrating, they have very low kinetic energy. And because they're closely packed together, they have very negative potential energy. So what if we heat this up, but don't heat it enough to turn into a liquid. What actually happens there? Well, if we heat up a solid, these particles are going to vibrate more. So they're going to have more kinetic energy, but they actually don't get further away from each other. So their potential energy stays the same as it. So that's when we heat it before it becomes a liquid. We make them vibrate more, but we don't actually change their separation. However, once we're going from the solid phase into the liquid phase, at that point, what we're doing is instead of increasing kinetic energy, making them vibrate more, we're actually separating the particles more. So we're actually increasing the potential energy, not the kinetic energy. So when you heat without changing phase, you increase kinetic energy. When you heat and change the phase, kinetic energy stays the same, and we increase the potential energy. That's what's going on there. Okay, so if we just do make some observations first looking at a liquid, we can see straight away, they're, they're still fairly closely packed together. So, you know, our distances isn't getting much bigger when we change to a liquid. But you can see the pattern of arrangement is much less regular. So they're not so tightly packed, they're more, what's called randomly arranged. They're free to move around relative to one another there. 
So those are really the characteristics of your liquid. So you've got random arrangement of your um, atoms or molecules, but they're still packed close together, just not quite as closely packed as they are in a solid. So if we take this particle here, it doesn't have to stay in this position. This particle can move all the way over here and move around, but stay closely packed as stuff. So in terms of how they compare to solids, because they can move around, these particles are going to have more kinetic energy than they do in a solid. So their kinetic energy is going to be higher, and because they're slightly more separated, they're going to have less negative potential energy. So their potential energy is moving closer to zero. So just as before, if we heat up a liquid without turning it into the gas phase, what we're doing is we're increasing the kinetic energy. So these can move around faster uh, relative to one another. So we increase the kinetic energy, but the separation doesn't really change that much. But once we get to the boundary between the liquid phase and the gas phase, again, same as before, what happens now is the separation increases, but not so much the kinetic energy. So kinetic energy stays roughly the same. Your potential energy moves closer to zero, becomes less negative there. Okay, so let's move on to looking at gas. So again, starting off just making some observations, we can see the spacing has increased significantly compared to the liquid here. Um, and again, we can see the kind of random arrangement of particles. There's no regular pattern here. And that's the characteristics of a gas. So we've got random arrangement of the particles, and they're far more spread out from one another in a gas than they are in a liquid. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we've got the highest kinetic energy because they're moving around at the highest speed, and we have the least potential, or the closest to zero potential energy, or the least negative potential energy, you should really say there, because they're spread out. So if we heat up a gas, what happens is we increase the kinetic energy of these gas particles. So they'll move around at higher speed, but our potential energy is not really going to be changing. So our separation stays roughly the same. So for what's called an ideal gas, which we'll come on to more as we get into the gas laws and other topics, the kinetic energy is actually directly proportional to the temperature. So if we double the temperature, the kinetic energy of the particles will double. That's a really handy relationship that we'll get onto later on there. Okay, so those are each of the three phases in terms of kinetic energy and potential energy. So let's actually have a look at how we know about this. So what evidence do we have for this kinetic model of matter? Well, experiment that was done is uh, displays something called Brownian motion. So what we've got here is a gas. These little black dots you can see buzzing around all over the place represent gas particles. This yellow blob that you can see moving around is a smoke particle that we've injected into the gas. So smoke is much, much bigger than a normal gas particle. So we can actually see it maybe even like with our eyes or better with some sort of microscope or magnifier. But we can actually see the motion of this smoke particle. And so what you see is the smoke particle doesn't take any predictable part of it. The smoke particle moves entirely randomly around your gas. So that's how we know about this random motion of gas particles. You'll also notice that the smoke particle, you can see it sort of like zipping from side to side as if being, it's colliding with some other particles. And that's how we know the existence of these atoms or molecules in the gas, because each one of these little collisions alters the path of the smoke particle, and we know there's something going on here. And this whole process of random motion and collision is known as Brownian motion. So this is the real evidence that we collected for the kinetic model of gases here. Okay, so what we're going to do now is look on, look at how we can model this using mathematics. Okay, so very commonly when we're looking at heating materials, you will see a graph that looks like this. And it essentially shows what happens to the temperature of a material as we heat it up. And it has some, a couple of surprising points in it that really illustrate the stuff that we've been talking about so far. So, um, there's these parts, A to B, C to D, and E to F, which are kind of what you'd expect, that if you put more energy in, the temperature rises there. 
What's confusing is these red sections here where temperature isn't changing despite the fact we're putting more energy into the system. So these are the points we're getting what's called phase change, or this one is melting and this one is vaporization there. So we're changing between solid and liquid and between liquid and gas on those red lines. So this is to do with what I talked about before, where I said during a phase change, the kinetic energy of whatever your material is doesn't change, it's the potential energy that changes. So during this phase here, because the kinetic energy isn't changing, the temperature isn't changing. Because like I said before, temperature and kinetic energy are directly proportional to each other. So if kinetic energy doesn't change, temperature doesn't change either. So, during here, where we're switching between the liquid and solid phases, we are getting no change in temperature because it's the potential energy that's changing and becoming less negative during that phase. Likewise up here, when we go from liquid to gas, it's the potential energy that's changing, not the kinetic energy during a phase change. And that's the reason behind the shape of this graph, this idea of potential energy from the bonds between the different atoms that you have there. Okay, so let's explore this graph a little bit more. So, we're going to look, um, first of all, when we stay in the same phase. So, we're looking at these blue lines here. And this concept you should have probably come across before called specific heat capacity. So, during these blue phases here, what you'll find is it takes a fixed amount of energy to change one kilogram of that substance by one degree Kelvin. And that is known as the specific heat capacity of the material. So to express that in mathematical form, it says that Q, which is the amount of thermal energy it takes to raise uh, each kilogram of material by one degree Kelvin, is a fixed value, and that's given the symbol C there. And you should probably have seen this equation before in your previous study of thermal physics and that kind of thing. So that should be fairly straightforward, and like I said, this applies to these blue sections of the graph where temperature changes as you give heat energy. If we look at the other phases, uh, we're going to first focus on this one down here, which is the change between solid and liquid. So during that point, it takes a fixed amount of thermal energy to turn one kilogram of that material from one phase to another, and that's called the specific latent heat of fusion. And that's for this melting boundary here, it's called fusion. So we get this equation here that the thermal energy required per kilogram of the material is has a specific value, it's given the symbol L, and I've put a subscript of fusion to distinguish it from the other one, which we'll see in a second. Uh, so that's what's going on in this section here. Um, so the more you, the more of a substance you have, the more energy it takes to change phase, essentially. Let's have a look at the other boundary. So if we look at this one up here, the red, so as we go from liquid to gas, it takes again a fixed amount of energy per kilogram but it's going to be a different amount of energy to this one down here because of the difference in potential energies. So that's called specific latent heat of vaporization, which tells you how much thermal energy you need to supply per kilogram to go from a liquid to a gas, or conversely, how much energy you need to remove per kilogram to go from a gas to a liquid. It works both ways on this graph there. So those two parts, the last ones, you probably would not have come across before and they'll be new to you, um, but that's essentially a way of modelling this potential energy that we've talked about in this video. Okay, so just to quickly recap the things that you should take away from this. Um, so you should be able to describe the basic properties of solid liquids and gases um, in terms of their arrangement, whether they're random or organised, and how fast the particle is travelling. You should also be able to explain it in terms of kinetic and in terms of potential energy as well. Um, so then lastly what we talked about is what happens as we heat up or also as we cool down the material. So again, you should be able to explain that in terms of kinetic and potential energy and also mathematically model it using specific heat capacity, specific latent heat of fusion, specific latent heat of vaporization as well. So those are the things you should be able to do. If any of those things are kind of like, mm, I don't know how to do that, please do go back and find the appropriate section in this video or look it up in your textbook, revision guide, whatever you'd like. 
Um, but if you have any questions or something's not clear, please do feel free to comment below this video and I'll try and clear that up for you. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video.